Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ahmad Al Taubin. I'm working for Saudi Aramco. Uh, today, in my presentation, I will share with you our practical experience and the lessons learned from upgrading a conventional wastewater treatment, treatment plant to an MBR plant, which is membrane bioreactive plant. Okay. Uh, the outline of my presentation, I will just give you a quick brief here on my presentation. I'll show you a location map. I'll talk about the old plant and then the new plant. And I will explain the lessons learned we had and what are the things we should consider when we build such a facility in a desert climate area. And then I will end up my presentation with a conclusion. Okay. This is a location map for our site. I'll just stop that. If you can see, this is the in Saudi Arabia where our STP is located. Okay, I'll stop that again. You can see that our plant is located in a desert area all around the sand dunes. Okay. Here, this is the plant. It is built over almost 120 acres of land. And this is a town. And here, this is the camp. Okay, which is the camp where the wastewater is going to. Okay. We are treating the wastewater of the other. It's in fact like a resort in a desert. And the intent was is to reuse that water for the as tertiary irrigation here. Okay. Now I'll explain about the old plant quickly. The old plant was basically consists of two bioreactors, conventional wastewater treatment, clay fire, aeration tank, and aerobic digester. And here you can see we have those sludge dying beds. And behind we have the blower building. And the wastewater at the end, the treated water is here. This is secondary, actually, uh, effluent coming from the clarifier. The waste sludge is going to those sludge drying beds. And these are the evaporation ponds. So basically, the treatment plant is treating only the secondary level, and we are wasting that water. Uh, why we decided to upgrade the plant is because we have regulations from the government and the company policies changed by that time because that plant was built like in 1975 and things changed. So the policies now say any treatment plant treats water more than 100 cubic meters per day, you should have a tertiary treatment and reuse the water. So we cannot just leave it go like that. So the upgrade scope for uh, our project was to expand the plant from 0.5 to 0.92 million gallons per day. If you are familiar with cubic meters, it is from 1900 to almost 3,500 cubic meters per day. And we selected the membrane bioreactor uh, treatment just to produce the tertiary uh, water we needed, which will be used for unrestricted irrigation. Why we selected the membrane bioreactor? Maybe all of you are familiar with that. I will just say that it will produce almost a BOD, which is less than 5 milligrams per liter. We have a really high tertiary effluent. Um, the turbidity is 0.2. We will have less facilities, and this is normally what the vendors will tell us, and we know that we, we, we can eliminate the clarifiers and the filters. Uh, it is there is possibility for remote operation and we need less manpower, less power consumption, consider, and less operation and maintenance. Uh, this is a 3D view for uh, our design for the membrane plant. I'll just go through it. Uh, we started here, this is a septage receiving facility uh, because we are in a remote area some areas in the old town is not served. So there are still vacuum trucks coming and hauling the sewage to the treatment plant. And this is one of the important issues here we will discuss, we will explain. Uh, and the sewage that's coming from the treatment plant and the septage receiving is going to a uh, headworks here where we have screening, which is coarse screening first. And we have a flow measurement 
inflow pump station. Uh, we have here, uh, I think the mouse is not working. If I have something, okay. We have two grid removal facilities, and we have two equalization tanks. Equalization tanks are important in, uh, in the MBR treatment because they can actually reduce the peaks going to the membrane. And then followed with three trains of membrane by reactor tanks. This is the operation building. This is the blower building nearby. These are two tertiary storage tanks. The sludge line bits were kept as is. We didn't uh, change that because, again, we are in, uh, in the desert. We have plenty of sun, and uh, we can still use them. And we have a sodium hypochlorite building here, which we are using for disinfection. And this is the control uh, MCC. And we have a navigation pumping station here, uh, which pumps, finally, the tertiary effluent to uh, the community for tertiary irrigation. Uh, on the right side, we utilized one of the evaporation pumps, which were used for uh, evaporating the secondary effluent. We utilized it as emergency pump. So we lined it. So whenever we have a wet weather uh, flow, we have high flow, for whatever reason, we can bypass to the emergency storage and then pumping it slowly to the treatment plant. So this is a protection. And we kept the remaining uh, evaporation ponds also again for emergency during winter time when we don't really use that much of water for irrigation. This is the plant, how it looks like after it is built. These are the uh, membrane by reactor tanks. You can see it's full of automated things. It's open actually, and we have like uh, here a crane and we have a hanger, so it's open to atmosphere. The treatment plant performed very well, and we get really good uh, results from the uh, from the treatment. The TSS was like 0.6, BOD is one, uh, ammonia 0.06, and it's all within the limit. Actually, much better than the limits we had put for the tertiary uh, treatment. Okay, with that success we have, this is really the success thing we have, we have really good uh, tertiary effluent, and we were able to use it for irrigation, and now I'm coming to the lessons learned. Actually, those are some of the major important lessons learned. Uh, the use of existing facilities, it is important really to consider this from the early stage of the project. Consider, study it very well. In our case, we tried here to utilize the existing, uh, existing uh, bioreactors as storage tanks. Okay, but the lesson that we learned really, th th that thing delayed the project for almost six months. And we wasted more than 570,000 cubic meters of tertiary water. Why? Because we had to decommission those things after we built the plant. Okay, so we couldn't use them during uh, when, when we were operating the a new plant. Uh, the other thing is the uh, blower building. We have a blower building, the old one. We tried to utilize that building. And what happened that the equipment that we installed in this building came to be really much bigger than what we expected during the design. You know, vendors, when they give you the information, they try to give you some compact things and whatever. <laughs> we can see it in the other uh, also slide. Um, it came to be that it is much bigger, and we ended up with a congested, a congested place. Uh, material specification is very important in, uh, uh, you know, when you design a plant or when you build a plant in, in desert area. Fiberglass handrails, grating. Okay, they say it's okay, it's acceptable, you can install it, that's fine. We have no problem, but the reality is those fiberglass handrails, after actually two months of installation, it started to, getting, to get like whitish, and they lost like uh, the, the color, and they are not really as strong as, you know, what you would expect. So, um, from our experience now, we don't really recommend having those in a, you know, an open area under the sun. Aluminum, you need to be very careful about uh, specifying the aluminum uh, handles. We tried actually at the beginning to put the aluminum and then we changed it to fiberglass because the aluminum here that we use, 
uh, was a riveted type of aluminum handrails, and it was really not safe. Whenever you put your hand, you can easily has, you have a scratch in your hand. So it's not really safe. PVC, not recommended at all in hot weather or under the sun. You can see the color of the PVC change. It means it got impacted with the UV, and uh, very soon it will get better and, and break. So never use PVC. Concreting in hot weather is, is a challenge. We had many cases, many projects, okay? And in this case, it's very important for concrete to, to plan it, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in time, you time it and plan it, and have a proper procedures when you do the pouring of the concrete. In our case, in our project, actually, what happened, we had this tank was the first retaining, a water retaining structure in the plant. So the contractor, when he, when he built it, uh, he built it, it was, it wasn't uh, planned, you know, that it would be in during the uh, night time or whatever. So he put the concrete, we ended up with honeycombs, we ended up with the cracks. We tried to solve it with uh, epoxy injections and whatever, it didn't work. And the only way we got it solved is by building another, in, another tank inside that tank and using self-compacting concrete. So it was really very expensive. The solution was, was expensive. Accessibility, I think this is a self-explanation explanation, uh, photo. You can see the air piping on top of a walkway. So that's why we say always, it's not related to really to hot weather, but here it is important to, to consider these things from the early stage of the design, not to keep it to the contractor or to the vendor. Uh, in our plant, we left part of the plant for the vendor to design, okay, and uh, it wasn't really looked at very well, and we ended up with having catwalkways on top of these just to have accessibility. Uh, it's, not, it's not that good. Uh, this is another photo from another plant. If you see, this is also a vendor design and a contractor. It wasn't also designed from a, a design office. Uh, and you can see the, the piping spilled all over the ground. And if you want to access, let us say, this valve, you have to, to jump over all these piping. So design, at early design, is very important to, to consider the accessibility. Design and vendor coordination. Um, we have a control room here in this plant. And what happened, like what I explained uh, earlier, that you need to consider more space because the vendors will give you um, like a small dimension equipment. So if you don't consider more space, you end up with, like our case, we combined the control room with an office just to have a space. And even though you can see the corridor is very difficult even to, to walk in. MBR. Now this is a surprise we have. Uh, MBR is very sensitive. Whatever you, you say, it's, um, it's very critical. And there are many factors uh, impacting the MBR operation. Um, I will explain two major issues. The, in, in, the wastewater characteristic is important. Even if you have sampling for the water, for the wastewater, and it shows that you don't have any fat oil grease, you need to be very careful also. Being in a remote area, like what we have in the middle of the desert, and we have vacuum tankers bringing uh, wastewater, okay? You, you need to consider that it will not be controlled source. We don't have any control source there. So the vacuum tankers will come and bring the sewage, haul it, and then dump it in the, to the plant. And this is one of the results we had. You can see the photo here, where the oil really impacted the membrane train, and it got clogged, and this is after, and you see it is manually even brushed and cleaned. So it affected our membranes. Um, one more important thing is the weather. Because our membranes are installed in open space, we have a shed only on top of it. It's not sufficient, actually. It came to be not sufficient. You can see our Just guests hurry. here. My yeah, bad. okay. You can see our guests here. They, we have birds coming with uh, leaves and whatever. And actually, it uh, impacted uh, the, uh, the treatment here, uh, the membranes itself. 
and all of these will be falling inside the, the tanks. Um, here we have instrumentation and control. This plant, because it is MBR, it is you know, full of uh, instruments and, and equipment. And those are sensitive and they can break any time. So you need to be very careful and ready with uh, like spare parts when you start commissioning the plant. Okay, based on these lessons learned, things to consider. In technology selection, when you select it, you need to consider these things, wastewater inflow characteristic, site location, weather condition, availability of skilled personnel, very important. Um, in this area, maybe we have that problem. Availability of spare parts is a major problem we have. Being in that remote area, those spare parts are not available, and they are long lead items, and you have to order them, and sometimes you, you need like three months to get the, uh, the, those equipments. In design stage, you need to have a real good coordination between the equipment supplier and the, and the people doing the plant. Uh, you need to have more space. You need to have a qualified consultant. This is very important. Some people, they say that the consultants we have are good in doing the, the, the design, but even if you have a good consultant with electro a good electromechanical and civil work, that's fine, but you need to have the process people to do the design for, for you in, in terms of uh, like sewage treatment. You need to provide complete and precise construction specification, and you need to have a well-defined matters of responsibility between client and contractor and vendor. During construction, you should have a realistic schedule. You know, here we had like six months of delay. Uh, you need to have a qualified construction contractor and strong inspection team. During commissioning and the uh, startup, you need to have qualified also uh, commissioning team. You should have the order manual is very important. You should have it before you start the plant. In conclusion, uh, location and weather condition must be highly considered during technology selection uh, due to their major impact on efficiency and reliability of the technology. Complete detailed design and well-defined scope results in minimizing change orders and reduces cost. And readiness of one in manual, availability of critical spare parts and training of the plant personnel prior to commissioning and setup are required for smooth plant operation. And thank you very much.